Aloha and welcome to Hawaii Together on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kelee Akina, your host and president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. My guest today is Gail Pooley, a good friend and associate professor of business management at BYU Hawaii and also a Grassroot Institute scholar. Gail has taught for BYU Hawaii and at colleges and universities on the mainland and internationally. He's a fellow of the Discovery Institute and serves on the Foundation for Economic Education Faculty Network. Gail and his colleague, Marion Tupi, are well known for their work in the Simon Abundance Index, which is a measure of how the scarcity of resources has changed over time. Gail joins me today to talk about his new book, Super Abundance, the story of population growth, innovation, and human flourishing on an infinitely bountiful planet. What an intriguing title. <laughs> Gail will also be talking about the implications of his thoughts for Hawaii and the world. Gail, welcome back to the program. So glad to have you today. It's great to be here, Keely. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, we've been seeing each other at conferences across the country as you've been taking your message uh, to the world, really. Uh, are you getting a good reception to some of your ideas? Well, um, we've really been surprised at uh, how how pleased uh, people have been with what we have discovered, uh, this idea that as population increases, that our resources are increasing at actually a faster rate. And that's really what the book is about. Um, we developed this framework that allows us to look at the what we call the time price of things. And that's based on this idea that we buy things with money, but we really pay for them with time. So if we can measure how much time it takes you to earn the money to buy something, uh, we can convert a money price into a time price. For example- well, That's very fascinating. So I look forward to sharing your book with a lot of people. You know, the, the world's population is expected to grow to more than 8 billion people by the end of this year. Uh, there are a lot of people, Gail, who fear that the world cannot sustain that growth. What do you think is creating those concerns? Why, why do we have such a fear of this? Well, we've had this history of uh, Malthusianism, which is really this idea that uh, was, was advanced by Thomas Malthus back in 1798 that population was going to increase, but we could only increase food production at a much lower rate. In other words, food, food production grew at a linear rate, but population would grow at a geometric rate. And as a consequence of this, we would, we would end up um, kind of collapsing. Um, and this, uh, this argument uh, has kind of captivated the minds of much of our culture over the last 200 years. So we saw uh, it kind of rise up again in the 60s with the publication of Paul sure. Ehrlich's The Population Bomb. We saw it in the early 70s with uh, other books like The Limits to Growth. We saw it in our culture with movies like Soylent Green. And so we've had this uh, idea in the culture that we live in a planet that has a fixed number of atoms. And if you add more people to it, that uh, everybody's share is going to get smaller and smaller. And now, you've <laughs> actually countered that with your own research and your first major book on the subject was entitled super abundance give our viewers a fifty thousand foot view of what your primary message is to counter who the those we call the prophets of doom okay um the the primary message is that is that economics is not about atoms it's not about we recognize that there are a fixed number of atoms on the planet but economics is not about atoms. Economics is about knowledge. And what the difference between our age and the Stone Age is entirely due to this growth in knowledge. Knowledge is what makes atoms valuable. And we don't appear to have any kind of a limit on this ability that we have to discover, create, share, and consume knowledge. It's knowledge that makes things valuable. And knowledge comes from human beings. It begins with human beings that have ideas, that those ideas then become inventions, and those inventions can become innovations. And so it's really knowledge, the growth in knowledge, that we should be focusing on. And we can, we can measure that. Well, that's a fascinating thesis. Uh, instead of looking at finite resources and thereby putting a cap on what we can actually produce and envision for the future, 
we look at knowledge itself and the capacity of knowledge to actually impact the finite resources that are out there. Uh, tell me first a little bit about your co-author, Marion Tupi. Uh, wh why did you both decide to start writing on this topic? And are there other authors and researchers out there who collaborate with you, who've inspired you? Well, I, I actually discovered Marion on, on Twitter. He'd written this nice little article, which was a follow-up to this bet that occurred back in the 1980s between Paul Ehrlich, the author of The Population Bomb, and an economist, uh, Julian Simon. And they'd made this bet in 1980 about what was going to happen uh, to these five non-renewable metals. It was copper, chromium, nickel, tin, and tungsten. And by 1990, the real price of these five metals had, had dropped by 36%. So our initial research question was, would Simon win this bet today? And so we went back to 1980, um, expanded the set of resources from just these five to 50. So we include energy and food, uh, materials, um, minerals and metals. And then we also extended the period from 1980 up to that point to 2018. So we, we made a much larger database to analyze. And then we, uh, and then we subjected it to this analysis. We suspected that there would be at least one of these fifty commodities that had become less abundant. And to our kind of astonishment, not a single one had become um, more scarce. In fact, on the average, the time price or the time it takes to earn the money to buy this basket of fifty commodities had fallen by over seventy percent. Now remember that. Uh, world population also grew by almost 3 billion people over this period. So as, as population was increasing, the price of these things were all going down. In other words, they were becoming much, much more abundant. And so that was our initial paper that we did, and we called this the Simon Abundance Index. Um, and then as a consequence of that paper, we decided we should look at other things as well. So we went and went back further in time, went back to 1850 and found commodity prices and compared them to wages and developed time prices for those. And uh, so Marion and, and I, he's with the Cato Institute. He and I just developed this great kind of working relationship where we were both very curious about this. And uh, so we would just find these data sets, do this analysis and produce our findings. And that's what what really evolved into the, the book that we wrote. Well, I, I read time price quite frequently in the literature that you produce. And it's it, a new addition to our, our vocabulary of looking at resources and, and the future. How would you apply that to some of the struggles that we're facing in the world today? How, how can we talk more about the value of time price? Well, I think we go back, you know, there are money prices uh, and the money prices, we, we kind of separate that into nominal prices and real prices. In other words, what's the price today uh, in terms of dollars and cents and what was it yesterday? And we make these adjustments to try to say, well, inflation is this percent. All uh, inflation is doing is just telling us just how uh, much the price has changed. It's not telling us about the affordability. In order to really count calculate and determine if something's becoming more or less affordable, you've got to compare it to wages. So what is the price divided by what are the wages? And that ratio really gives you the time price. So if a pizza costs $20 and you're earning $20 an hour, that pizza, the time price is one hour. So money prices are expressed in dollars and cents. Time prices are expressed in hours and minutes. So what we do is we go back in time and determine what the time price is of a product or service, and then compare it to what the time price is today. And that percentage change in the time price over time is really uh, the, the basis for what we should be doing when we're trying to determine if things are becoming more or less abundant. If it takes you half, a, half, a, if it takes you half the time to work to earn something today as it did 10 years ago, your life is twice as abundant. Um, Jordan Peterson makes an interesting observation. He says that uh, if you can do the same amount of, you can, if you can produce the same amount in half the time, 
you're twice as smart. You've doubled your knowledge. And that's what we that? try to do. Yeah, that's what we try to do is we try to, can you measure the growth in knowledge with time? Uh, George Gilder, our friend George Gilder has these three beautiful little uh, principles that he, he states. He says, wealth is knowledge, growth is learning, and money is time. And that gives you the basis to derive a theorem that you can measure the growth in knowledge with time. So just look at how much in, in the fundamental issue is that when, when you experience innovation, when an innovation happens, it shows up in the economy all over the place. It shows up in lower prices, but it also shows up in higher incomes. And so unless you're looking at the relationship between the price and wages, you're really not fully capturing what innovation is doing. And that's what we attempted to do in the book. It's fully uh, capture innovation. I remember when I was a young man and growing up in elementary school and then even all the way through my early years of college, in order to look something up, a very basic fact, something from history or something from philosophy or science, I'd have to get ready to walk to the library. And then I remember back at Northwestern University, I'd have to put my winter clothes on and my cover my, my chest and fight the snow and get to the library and find out that the book wasn't there. Today, yeah. you just pull up your phone and, and you, you, Google, you Google the question. And it's so much different uh, than before yeah. when you talk about the role of time in terms of the measurement of value. Now, there's another value that you and I have talked about a lot and that is economic freedom. It's an important principle, the extent to which individuals, organizations, and countries are free from government control and being able to enter into free will economic decisions with other people and other entities. Now, in your work, I think we see some correlation. Um, let me ask you this question. Places like India, China, and other countries that have very rapidly growing populations also tend to have less economic freedom and relatively high poverty rates. What could these countries learn from the principles of superabundance? And has embracing economic freedom helped in the past? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, part of our book is we looked at the um, economic growth in terms of uh, uh, these time prices for 42 different countries. China and India both were included in our, in our index. And what we really have come down to is this idea that, that this growth in knowledge is a function of people times freedom. So you can have a country that has a lot of people, but if they don't have much freedom, you're not going to have much innovation because it really is, is innovation fundamentally starts with this discovery of new knowledge. And that requires a culture where freedom is present, the freedom to be able to act on your ideas. And then turn that idea into the invention that you are imagining, and then having a free market where you can go test that invention to see if it's actually created value or not. As you see these countries with large populations, China and India, move toward a more innovation-friendly or knowledge creation-friendly environment, you're going to see people being able to escape poverty and then make contributions to the rest of us on the planet with their new discoveries. So we're very hopeful that that uh, people will be able to recognize that, uh, you know, the governments will be able to recognize, look, if you want to escape poverty, you've got to let people have the freedom to, to really pursue new knowledge. Because if wealth is knowledge, what do you have to do to give people the incentives and the ability to discover this new knowledge the rest of us all benefit from? Bringing the conversation a little bit closer to home, Gail, uh, you and I both know here in Hawaii that a lot of people think that there are too many people uh, in the islands, that, that we are actually overpopulated. Uh, for some time, some organizations and government agencies actually uh, communicated that our population was growing when, in fact, we look at the data and find that over the last decade, our population has started to decline and is projected to decline further in the next several years. What kinds of problems does it pose for Hawaii that we have a declining population? Uh, how, how does that actually, how do you think that's going to impact our islands? Well, uh, 
I'm not an expert on Hawaii, but I can tell you from, from the perspective of how do we create more knowledge, it fundamentally starts with human beings that have this freedom. So when Hawaii becomes less and less attractive, you have fewer and fewer people here that can work on solving the problems and creating the new ideas you need to be able to, to, um, to create this wealth around us. And uh, uh, knowledge has this interesting characteristic that if someone comes up with an idea in, in uh, San Jose or New York, that the, the knowledge can come to Hawaii, but what Hawaii is missing out on is those individuals that are, that are here with us to help us in this discovery of new knowledge. When they leave, their ability to share and create ideas with people around them also leaves with them. So we're, we're losing this asset to another part of the planet. Wouldn't you say that Hawaii could in some ways be a laboratory, uh, a petri dish, so to speak, for testing theories, such as the theory as to whether or not population increase is bad for a place. Um, there are, are, there's no lack of individuals claiming that the resources of Hawaii are being used up rapidly and just can't sustain a growing population here. W what are we f discovering about that? Well, what we discover is typically when you have people and they have the freedom to be able to innovate, they discover more resources. You don't use up resources, you create resources. So Hawaii's ability to attract population that are creative, that um, have imaginations, uh, that asset that Hawaii has could be leveraged into creating an environment that's much more open to, to this creativity and knowledge creation. Um, this idea that if we add more people to the island, I mean, look at where the island was 100 years ago uh, compared to today and ask yourself, is Hawaii richer today in terms of our standard of living, what our lives are like than it was 100 years ago? I wake up every morning and I'm just, I'm just astonished that I live on a chain of semi-dormant volcanoes in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and I have air conditioning and I've got a Costco, and it's just, <laughs> and it's all a consequence of human beings being able to adapt and be creative and be able to turn liabilities into assets, to be able to discover new ways of taking these liabilities and adding knowledge to them, and suddenly they become a very valuable asset to the rest of us. Well, talking about energy and liabilities, you know, Hawaii has among the highest gasoline prices in the nation. And it just seems that the oil prices will continue to rise and we're dependent upon importing this. Are we going to forever pay higher prices at the pump? Uh, that's possible. <laughs> but is that, due to, is that due to a fundamental physical uh, challenge in energy or is it due to uh, a political environment? If you have the Jones Act, if you have other things that are going on politically on the planet that prevent this uh, ability to, to uh, acquire energy, you could have a challenge. I've always advocated that if Hawaii wants to be a laboratory, they should be a laboratory of, of a green, clean um, energy state, which uses nuclear power. Uh, if we're really concerned about lowering CO2 and minimizing the amount of land that's necessary to create energy, it's got to be nuclear. The innovations recently with these micro, small nuclear plants, uh, Hawaii could really lead the nation in, in how you can create an independent, uh, an energy self-reliant and green uh, place uh, for growth. Uh, using uh, nuclear innovations. So, uh, I mean, it'd be lovely if we had uh, electricity rates that we knew were going to be, you know, 10 and 12 cents a kilowatt hour instead of 30 and 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, like, 
Idaho and some of these other places who have uh, access to much lower energy costs. Hawaii has this ability to do this if they open themselves up to, uh, to these uh, emerging innovations that are occurring in the nuclear energy industry. I, uh, I, I live up here at Laia and I see the, the windmills and the land that was used to uh, develop that and what it looks like. And I just, you take the most expensive land on the planet to build windmills that do not produce the kind of reliability that you need that require redundant energy systems down in Honolulu to be able to support. It's just, uh, it, it's really uh, unfortunate. You know, there are many metropolitan areas across the nation that benefit from the fact that large populations can come and go uh, so that uh, you have higher levels of commerce and diversification of industry and so forth. Uh, do you think that the, the push to limit the population in Hawaii has a negative impact upon whether we can diversify economies? and be less dependent upon merely one or two major industries. Right, when you when you limit the population, I mean, who are you going to limit? Who are you gonna say can't come to Hawaii? Uh, I think you've gotta be open to the ideas. We wanna be an attractive place for the most creative, innovative people on the planet to come and and live and work and contribute here if possible. And, people that uh, have that kind of creativity are also uh, going to want to live in a place where they have other people around them and they have uh, services and uh, resources that that will uh, give them the kind of life that they want to enjoy. And when you limit the number of people, I mean, I had several of my friends that have left the island because they just they lost their businesses uh, through COVID and they've had to leave. And it's a tragedy that I uh, think those people have left. The value that they were creating disappeared with them. So uh, Hawaii's got to be open to the idea that we want to be this attractive, beautiful place for people that want to come and, and uh, uh, create new value for the rest of us. Well, Gail, uh, many popular reviewers, including The Economist magazine or author Jordan Peterson, have given positive reviews of super superabundance. What are the academics saying and what are you also hearing in the media in general? Well, we've had uh, you know, a number of academics review the book. We had uh, um, several of our economists at uh, Harvard had looked at the book, uh, pre-publication, the manuscript, and we were you know, very concerned that we had made a mistake somewhere in the, uh, in the, uh, in the analytical framework or the equations or that the data wasn't uh, sufficient. And so it's gone through pretty heavy review from academic peers. And then it was reviewed by a couple of Nobel Prize winning economists, um, Angus Deaton and Paul Romer. Um, we've also had a number of other, uh, you know, academics that have looked at it. Uh, it's not, uh, We've also had Jason Furman, who was the uh, chairman of the uh, um, Council of Economic Advisors under uh, President Obama. He reviewed it and gave it high marks. So I think it's really a message to everyone that, you know, irrespective of what may, what political party you might be affiliated with, the story is this planet, human beings on this planet have been able to, to continue to increase our abundance through all kinds of um, these kind of uh, tragedies, wars, recessions, we continue to grow at about three to 4% a year. And if you can grow at that rate, you're going to double abundance every 20 years. And that's what, uh, that's what the story is that I think we need to be able to recognize this is what's been happening. And if we can continue to do this going forward, we should expect this growth going forward as well. Well, that's certainly optimistic news for the world and for those of us in Hawaii. And I want to thank you and your co-author for the work that you're doing in the book, Super Abundance. Thank you so much for being on the program again and uh, wish you the very best, Gail. My guest, All right. Uli.
All right. Thanks. Terrific. And everybody, uh, this is Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Until next time, I wish you a great aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.